Good morning. My name is Jenny Nelson. The scripture for this morning comes from the book of Luke. As Jesus came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, my friends. My name is Jason Mankey, and I'm one of the pastors at People's Church in Oregon, Wisconsin. Today was supposed to be the last week of our sermon series, Soul Reset. But instead of concluding that sermon series this week, I want to talk about race because of what's going on in our country, in our state, and just up the road in Madison. Before I get into the bulk of our conversation this morning, I want to start out by saying that the actions of our president have been nothing less than reprehensible and blasphemous. His use of rubber bullets and tear gas to move peaceful protesters out of the way for a photo op, threatening military action against uh, his own citizens, whom he is charged to protect, and the blatant racist rhetoric he uses is beyond anything any citizen of the United States, much less a follower of Jesus, should tolerate. I don't believe it's possible to say you support President Trump's current policies and actions and say you're doing so based on the teachings of Jesus. Following Jesus' command to his followers in Matthew 5:44, I would ask you to pray for him, all who follow his lead, and those who are convinced that he's doing the right thing. We need Now we've talked about race and racism several times over the past few years at People's Church um, in sermon series like Fear of the Other. And I know there are many, so many things we could and need to talk about in regard to race, our faith, politics, and our life here uh, in the United States. But the truth is, is this is not going to be a one and done topic for us as a church. We need to work on race and racism over the long term. So I'm not going to try and talk about everything in just this one sermon. Rather, I'm going to focus on the role the majority of us who are members of People's Church have to play in racism. And when I say the role the majority of us um, play, I'm talking about people who look like me. That's white people. For those of you who aren't white, I hope you still feel God's presence in this message and in this service. But I believe that until white people like you and me begin to take our role in discrimination, racism, and white supremacy seriously, working for change as if lives depend on it because they do, we aren't going to be healed from the sin of racism in our society. And I will also quite plainly confess that I need to hear this sermon as much as anyone else. As a white person, it's easy to ignore the problem of race. It's easy to deny that we have any part in it and to admit that we're complicit in systematic racism can be followed with feelings of guilt and shame, which makes us want to ignore it even more. When I was in seminary in North Carolina, I found that I was living in a state and a community that was far less segregated than the state of Wisconsin and any community I'd lived in in Wisconsin. My class in seminary was uh, over 120 students, over a quarter of whom identified as a race or ethnicity other than white. I also found that the issue of race was talked about more openly in the South than it ever was in the Midwest. During my second year of school there, we had regular open conversations 
that were meant to help address the racism that was present there in the hopes that it would lead to the empowerment of people of color and healing across racial lines. And those conversations were often hard, painful, and tear-filled. Well, after one such gathering, I was walking back to my car with a classmate. She was explaining to the 23-year-old me that every white person was racist. This just didn't sit right for me. For me, that was tantamount to calling me a Nazi. How could I, a person who was studying to be a pastor, a person who had a black sister, be racist? So I rejected her statement by saying, no, I don't believe that. I believe that everyone's prejudiced, but I don't believe everyone's a racist. I don't like telling this story very often because in doing so, I'm reminded how wrong I was, and I feel bad about it. But I've grown and learned a lot since then, and it wasn't the only time I was wrong in regard to racism and the role I play as a white person in it. I'm sad to say that I know uh, that I will be wrong in the future but I have worked on educating myself and growing since that time, and I hope that I will continue to do so throughout my entire life. And if you, sitting there at home, don't hear anything else I have to say this morning, please hear this. The only way racism and white supremacy is going to end in our country is if we, white people, don't see it as someone else's problem, but confess that it is our problem. It's going to be perpetuated unless we take responsibility for it, educate ourselves, learn how to live and interact differently, and give up our privilege. Today's scripture talks about Jesus crying over Jerusalem because the religious leaders and the people in power of that time were unwilling to acknowledge their sins, their shortcomings, and therefore have cut themselves off from God in such a way that Jesus can't even gather them in. Because God has given them free will to reject the love of God if they want to by not loving those whom they are oppressing. Likewise, I picture Jesus looking over his white followers in this country and weeping because we've den uh, denied his call to repent as well. I hear Jesus crying over us saying, if you, even you, had recognized on this day the things that make for peace, how often I have desired to gather you together as hens gather her broods her, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. The truth is, we have a choice. I believe that God is calling us to take responsibility for the race problem in this country and to educate ourselves over our entire lifetime so that we will not only change our behaviors, but we will also, by the grace of God, fight to change the structures that support systemic racism in our society. To that end, let me share some of what I have learned in hopes that it will help you, that it will be a starting place for you, or maybe a place for you to continue your work on racism. What I'm sharing is summarized and or quoted from a 2018 book written by white sociologist, a white sociologist named Robin D'Angelo called White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. I will be co-leading a six-week online discussion group focused on that book with Karen Davidson. And that uh, uh, discussion group, online discussion group, will start Wednesday, June 14th at 6.30 p.m. If you want to be a part of that discussion group, you can email me. I encourage you to do so at jason at peoplesumc.org or put your name, in, uh, uh, say you're interested in the comment section, either on Facebook or YouTube Live. So, 
Let's define some terms this morning. First, prejudice. Prejudice is prejudgment about another person based on the social groups to which that person belongs. These are thoughts and feelings, including stereotypes, attitudes, and generalizations that are based on little or no experience and then projected onto everyone in that group. Our prejudices tend to be shared because we all sit, swim in the same cultural water and absorb the same message. So, um, a simple def uh, example, if you live here in Madison, Wisconsin, and are a fan of the Wisconsin Badgers, you are probably have some prejudices against the Duke Blue Devils and their fans. All human beings have prejudice. We can't avoid it. Next definition, discrimination. Discrimination is action based on prejudice. These actions include ignoring, exclusion, threats, ridicule, slander, and violence. For instance, if the emotion we feel is strong because of our prejudice, extreme acts of discrimination may follow. And these acts of di discrimination are fairly easy to spot. However, if what we feel because of our prejudice is more subtle, like a mild discomfort, then discrimination is, the discrimination will likely be more subtle and more difficult to detect. So if I'm around a black person and I begin to talk differently than I would say around white people, or if I would normally ask inquisitive questions about the lives of my white friends and coworkers, but I avoid doing so with my black coworkers, well then I would be discriminating against them. Everyone has prejudice. Everyone discriminates. It doesn't matter what race, ethnicity, or gender you are. So there's no such thing as reverse discrimination. It's all just discrimination. Now, according to D'Angelo, when a racial group's collective prejudice is backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control, it is transformed into racism which is a system that functions independently from the intentions or self-images of the individual actors. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Let me repeat it. When a racial group's collective prejudice is backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control, it is transformed into racism, which is a system that functions independently from the intentions or self-images of the individual actors. Racism is a structure, it's not an event. It's a system, it's deeply embedded in the fabric of our society, and more often than not, white people tend to ignore racism because it's like a wind at our back aiding us in all of our endeavors, which is called white privilege. If you want to learn more about white privilege, I'd really recommend reading the book Waking Up White. Now people of color may hold prejudices and discriminate against white people, but they can't be racist because they lack the social and institutional power that transforms their prejudice and discrimination into racism. The impact of their prejudice on whites is temporary and contextual. Whites hold the social and institutional positions in society to infuse their racial prejudice into laws, policies, and norms in a way that people of color do not. So, say a bartender who is a person of color decides to ignore me while I'm trying to order a drink at a restaurant. But uh, that would be discrimination. But it's not racism because people of color cannot pass legislation that prohibits me and everyone like me, say, from buying a home in a certain neighborhood. Therefore, in the United States, only white people can be racist. Only whites have the collective social and institutional power and privilege over people of color. People of color do not have this power and privilege over white people. last definition. White supremacy. What do you hear, think of when you hear that, that statement? Do you think of ultra right-wing radicals? The KKK? 
While those are white supremacist groups, white supremacy is a term used to describe a socio-political economic system of do domination based on racial categories that benefits those defined and perceived as white. This is a system of structural power, privileges that privileges and centralizes and elevates white people as a group. So consider these numbers. The richest 10, Amer uh, 10 Americans are 100% white. U.S. Congress is 78% white. Of the 50 U.S. governors, 94% of them are white. Of our top military advisors, they're 100% white. Our president and vice president, 100% white. U.S. House Freedom Caucus, 99% white. Current U.S. presidential cabinet, 90% white. People who decide which TV shows we see, 93% white. People who decide which books uh, we read, 90% white. People who decide which news is covered, 85% white. People who decide which music is produced, 95% white. People who directed the top 100 grossing films of all time worldwide, 95% white. Teachers, 82% white. Full-time college professors, 84% white. The owners of men's professional baseball, basketball, and football teams, 94% white. These numbers aren't describing minor organizations in our society. These organizations shape our views, not only of the world, but of ourselves. Now we're almost done here. But before we wrap up, I want to ask you a question. How has this conversation made you feel? I'm sure you've had a number of feelings. Is one of them uncomfortable? If so, let me urge you, don't shove this discomfort. That's too often our reaction. Rather, consider that this discomfort may be a call from God to start or continue making changes, both in your life and in the world. Continue learning, continue growing, and working for racial healing and justice. If you want to be a part of my group, uh, Karen and Karen in my group, studying um, white fragility, please email me or make a comment. I think it is good when we grow together. My question for you this morning is, will you heed Jesus' call today to be a part of the solution and to repent of racism? Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we live in a broken world and we are broken people. We hurt others and others hurt us. We so often are able to ignore our role in the problems of this world because Lord, it's hard to look in the mirror. It's hard to recognize that we are a part of a problem. Infuse us with your grace and love this morning, gracious God. Remind us that your love is not contingent on what we do, but rather is based on who you are. And you are a loving Mother God who will never let us go, but who wants more from us than we often want or expect from ourselves. So with the confidence that you love us, help us to confess where we have fallen short. Help us to share our struggles and help us to be transformed. Open to us light for our darkness, Open to us courage for our fear. Open to us hope for our despair. Open to us peace for our turmoil. 
Open to us joy for your, our sorrow. Open to us strength for our weakness. Open to us wisdom for our confusion. Open to us forgiveness for our sins. Open, us, te open to us tenderness for our toughness. Open to us love for our hates. Open to us yourself for ourselves so that we may live your love each and every day in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.